Hi, everyone. I'm Jenny. I'm Paul. And Paul and I are here to talk to you about an experience we launched recently on Tinder called Swipe Night. Now, I'm going to take us through kind of the origins of how we got started with this idea. Paul's going to do the fun stuff around the creative <laughs> and the production. But you may be wondering, like, what is Swipe Night? So Swipe Night is an interactive, first-person, apocalyptic adventure um, on Tinder, where Tinder members can come through and make choices that dictate how the story unfolds, and then those choices dictate the matches that they have afterwards. So for those of you who may have been out of the dating game for a while, um, Tinder is the world's largest dating app. It started here in the US in 2012 on college campuses. And since then, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that Tinder has revolutionized the way that young people meet and date today. To the point now, Tinder's in over 190 countries. There are over 2 billion swipes a day on Tinder. And it's just, um, from a Gen Z perspective, it just makes Tinder such an iconic Gen Z brand because 50% of our audience is 18 to 25. So when you think about that, for Paul and I, getting to work on something so new and innovative like Swipe Night, at the scale and the impact of something like Tinder, it was just such a joy. But all of us in this room know that innovation is really messy, it's really hard, and it's never as pretty as you think it is or as pretty as it looks at the end. So Paul and I today wanted to take you through how Swipe Night was made, the messy parts mm -hmm. and all. So let's back up a little bit and just talk about where this idea started. So Tinder has a really clear mission, which is we try to make it easier and more fun for young people to meet and connect. And so in January, we were going, all right, how do we do this? How do we make it easier to meet and connect? How do we do this? And we started really thinking about three different um, three different things. Actually, would you mind just uh, backing up one slide? We started thinking about kind of three different areas. The first area was really this idea of shared experiences. And so we knew that like shared experiences like going to a mu music festival or enjoying food together was really something that was made it a lot easier to do conversations, right? And, but in Tinder, you would start to have these matches, you get dropped in, and you wouldn't, have a, you wouldn't know very much about the person, so it was really hard to make a conversation. So we were like, all right, how do we create a digital shared experience that would be a good conversation starter? The second thing we were thinking about was just this idea of concurrency, in that we knew that Tinder's really good when a lot of people come on it at the same time. So Sunday nights are the most active Tinder nights. People like to plan their weeks, they come on Tinder. And we could see when a lot of people came on at the same time, there were more matches or more conversations because the communication just flowed. So we started thinking like, how do we actually create this idea of a live event where we're really bringing people onto Tinder at the same time to have an experience together. And the last thing, just speaking about Gen Z, you know, with so much of our audience between the ages of 18 to 25, really just thinking about like, how do we build and design for Gen Z? We know that this is a really visual generation. They're speaking in GIFs, they're speaking in emojis. Video, of all things, is really their medium of choice. But we didn't really have any video on Tinder. So how could we do something with that? And then knowing that Gen Z, too, just is so into authenticity. How do we enable them to really represent themselves authentically, meet with other people in the same way? And that was really kind of set the bar for us of just what should we go out? And we set the bar to go out and create an interactive mini-series, for lack of a better word, built directly onto the Tinder platform that was designed to do what Tinder does best, which is to help you match and connect. So we all know that um, getting something off the page and into reality is really, really tricky, right? And so um, for us at Tinder, we really are trying to do rapid prototyping and get things off the deck and into our hands. So we wanted to go and we shot a really down and dirty prototype in LA, which was based around this idea of an epic date night. And you could make choices using the swipe to be able to see how this date unfolded and see how the night went. And it was really a great way for us to do it. There were so many things that we learned from this. A couple things really come to mind. The first thing that I would say is that using the swipe to make choices was really, really fun. But the choices we had in there weren't particularly fun. They were kind of boring. They were kind of throwaway. They were, um, you know, do you want to play darts or do you not want to play darts? Do you want hot sauce to your tacos? Do you not want hot sauce? And they didn't really say anything about you. So we knew we needed the choices to be more meaningful. The second thing was that a date itself was not a particularly exciting 
premise. You know, any of us can go on a date. Even the date challenged of us can probably imagine what a date is like. So we needed, we needed it to be something a little bit more exciting, something where you made those choices, you're like, I don't know what's going to happen. So that idea of heightened reality really came forward. And then the other thing we realized, too, is we had too much time baked into the decisions. So when you can sit there and think about, well, I don't know, what should I choose here? You almost always choose something that you, was going to make you look really good versus something that's tr really true about you. So we wanted to shorten down the decision times and make it really fast and really instinctual so that it would truly be an authentic representation of you. And then the last thing, which is, I think, such a surprise for us, is we had baked in all these little micro interactions into the experience. So like you could tap the screen really fast to run faster or to add more hot sauce. And people loved those. <laughs> and, um, what we realized is like it just kind of, I think it gave you a sense of control. You're like, oh, this is responding to me. Look, I'm controlling it. And so we started thinking, like, what are all the things on the phone that we can do? How do we use haptic to make the phone vibrate? How do you simulate text messages coming out in to really make the story progress? Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> I'm going to be walking through all the production and the content side of Swipe Night. Entering the content space in today's environment is very intimidating. Uh, especially when it's not your core business and your backyard is literally Hollywood. Uh, but we're in the golden age of content and the bar is extremely high. So we felt we had something really special with the prototype that we had designed, but we knew without a compelling story, we were, we were not going to be able to get our Gen Z members back to sink their teeth in every week, really, to engage with a story. So we knew we had to create a story that had incredibly high stakes. So as we dug in, we realized what stakes are higher than if the world would be ending? So we dug this idea, we leaned into the idea of imminent doom, and we brought it back to our members. And the response was incredible. But we've seen different versions of this story before. And it's been done very successfully, sometimes not as successfully. But how are we going to stand out? How are we going to be different? How was Tinder going to make an end of the world experience our own? So we dug into what was currently out there. And we saw that a lot of these end of the world stories occurred over the course of a year, months, weeks, sometimes days. We thought, what would happen if the world was going to end in three hours? So we dug into this idea even further, and we landed on our concept of this. You're watching a comet go across the Earth's sky with three of your best friends, and suddenly, a piece of it breaks off, creating straight towards you with nowhere to hide. As it enters Earth's atmosphere, a counter starts going down. Three hours until impact, three hours until the end of the world. Who would you want to spend that time with? Where would you want to go? Realistically, how far could you get? So we had the idea, but now we had to bring in the team to execute it. Our first order of business was finding a director. We needed somebody who could tell a story in a compressed time frame, someone who understood the nuances of action and drama and thrill, but could also strike a tone and balance all three. We also wanted somebody who had a very distinct visual style and a sensibility and was not afraid to try something new and take big, bold, creative risks. Enter. 23-year-old music video director, Karina Evans. After winning the BET Award for Best Music Video for Drake's God's Plan, Karina flew to the top of our list. And the moment she signed on for the project, the entire experience took off. But that was only half of the creative force and team that we needed. We needed to find our writers. We needed to find writers that were representative of Gen Z, could relay that voice, but could also balance the chaotic uh, design of branching narrative. And we found those two. Enter Nicole Delaney and Brandon Zuck. Having written on Netflix's Big Mouth and Facebook's Five Points, Brandon and Nicole struck a, a perfect blend of comedy and drama inside a very chaotic and multi-layered story environment. So now we had our team. What was next? We had to build this. For anybody in this audience who has attempted branching narrative, you understand how unbelievably difficult it is. It's very time consuming. You spend a lot of time in uh, development hell. Um, 
But to really crack where we were going to start on the branching narrative, we began at the end. Now, this is a spoiler alert for those of you who have not seen Swipe Night. I'm about to give away the ending. But we knew that the final shot of Swipe Night was always going to be the comet hitting Earth, obliterating everything. So we worked backwards, creating branching narratives that would loop you back to that moment. There was a lot of revisions, stories, choices, dialogue. Every single tweak created a ripple effect, not, across, not only across one episode, but the entire series. So we had to be very particular with what we did and how we built this. We kept three things in mind in the framework when we were building the tree. One, we always wanted to start our members together at the beginning and allow them to end somewhere else, which meant we had to build multiple story endings per episode. Two, there could be no wrong choices. Every choice had to lead to somewhere interesting or someone interesting. And three, every choice had to reveal something about our member. This could be a wide range of things, from music taste to preferences, interests, kind of food you like, or something a bit more moralistic, like when we asked users to choose between a helpless dog we, we asked users to, to help between saving a helpless dog or a human being. That actually happened in episode one. You'd be very shocked at what the numbers were. <laughs> the high 70s for saving the dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, so once we had our scripts, once we had our series arc, and once we knew what we were going to shoot, we wrapped everything up and we went down to Mexico City to film this. What you're going to see here are a bunch of behind the scenes stills and videos of our entire 17 day shoot in Mexico City. Like any production, this was incredibly intense. Uh, there were some problems and there were also tons of learnings. Um, we had a 17 day shoot schedule, 14 of those which were night shoots. And Swipe Night was shot all in first person POV which means we had one camera, and these were all tracking shots. Now, each episode ended up to be about five to eight minutes long, but we had to shoot five times that amount of content to take into account all the branching story narratives. To give you an idea of what that's like, it's like making 100 three-minute short films that are all different. So some of the other learnings we had with this, with this shoot and the technical difficulties were one, the tracking shots. Since we didn't give the ability to edit to our, well, since we didn't provide the ability to edit, it means we couldn't make many mistakes, and we definitely couldn't hide mistakes. So every single scene had to be perfectly choreographed and timed. I give credit to Karina and her amazing DP, Carolina. They spent a lot of time in pre-production storyboarding the entire script and every scene in finding transitions and how to wipe us into a scene and wipe us out since there were no cuts. Also, because this was a first person POV, the POV had to be gender neutral. We couldn't show identifiers. We couldn't show your hands, we couldn't show your feet. We couldn't have you pick something up. So we had to rely on character development and story development and these other characters to pull you through the entire uh, series. And also, we got to incorporate our favorite friend at Tinder, the swipe. <laughs> this was incredibly difficult because it is a core mechanism for operating swipe night, you swipe left or right. But during that decision, we call a, what it's called a live hold. And basically the camera is locked off in that, that, the, on that situation. And the, there's not a lot of real estate there. So we have to bring in a swipe design to make sure we weren't canceling anything out in, behind it. So we would shoot a take. We would bring it back. We would put the graphic over it, make sure we weren't covering a face or covering a critical decision, and then we would get out. So after shooting for about a month and a half, uh, secretly on the streets of Mexico City, we decided to wrap, bring it back, and start editing. And I'm going to send it over to Jenny, and she's going to walk you through the launch and the community response. So we launched Swipe Night on the first Sunday in October between the hours of 6 p.m. and midnight. Again, just thinking, like, how do we get people coming in at the same time? And then we launched the episodes consecutively over the next few Sundays of October. And I remember all of us sitting in the war room as we kind of had pushed this live, and we were all so tired at that point, and just starting to see the social media just come in. And it was awesome. It was one of those, like, 
Sally Field moments where you're like, oh my God, they like it. Um, because it's like the tweets were just so funny. People were debating the choices. They were giving shade to people who made choices they didn't agree with. And it was just, um, it really was more than we had even expected. And what was also amazing is we just, um, we weren't really sure what to expect in terms of how many participants would do this, how many wouldn't. And our viewership numbers and our participation numbers were so high to the point that we actually had more viewership than some really well-known HBO shows like Euphoria. And for us, Euphoria, we think, is like the epicenter of cool Gen Z culture. And for us to have outperformed that was really an indication, I think, that we were onto something. But more importantly, I would say that we definitely delivered on our mission to help people meet and connect. On Sundays when we ran Swipe Night, we had a 26% increase in matches. We had a 12% increase in messages. And that, to us, is really everything. That means that we're doing our jobs. So we're going to take season one of Swipe Night internationally. It launches um, in a bunch of different markets in February. I'm excited to see that. And as for us in the US, we're still figuring out what next is looking like, but it sure is a lot of fun thinking about it. So we're going to end with showing you a really short snippet of the first episode of Swipe Night. Thank you so much for having us. It's been a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. After being redirected by Jupiter's gravitational pull, Linklater's comet will now become the first in recorded history to pass this close to our humble planet. But don't worry, folks. We still have about 100,000 miles of breathing room between us and our visitor from the stars. Sawyer. And? Right? God, you get me. 